Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. We're doing a special service provider segment talking with Patrick Fendaro of Visa Franchise or VisaFranchise.com. A, a supporter of the Immigration Lawyers Toolbox magazine and a, a, just a great tool because so many of us have, uh, especially E2 Visa clients who don't know what to do. They want to invest. They want to come here. Uh, and what's great about what Patrick and his company do are, are provide a service to help people figure this stuff out, not just necessarily E2, but also uh, EB5. So let's jump into it. Patrick, um, how did you get involved in this field and, and, and how did this all come about? Sure, definitely. John, thanks a lot for having me on. And we started Visa Franchise back in 2015. And my background was in the financial markets. So I worked at JP Morgan out of college. And it's a family business together with my brother, Jack. He graduated from Georgetown and entered the leadership development program at Burger King. Mm -hmm. uh, and he worked with some other leading brands like Tim Hortons uh, during his tenure at the, the parent company, of Burger King Restaurant Brands International. Mm -hmm. And at the time, say 2014, while he was at Burger King, I was working for a fund that had some projects for the EB-5 investor visa. And we thought about the E2 visa being a good path for those that didn't have 500K to invest and wanted to move to the US faster. And we thought that franchising fit pretty well. Uh, and if you chose the right franchise, you could limit certain risks compared to doing a startup or an existing business. So that was the, the start of visa franchise. And, We've grown quite a lot and we've even expanded to create an online platform vettedbiz.com that has over 3000 franchises and businesses for sale, many of which are eligible for the E2 visa. And to date we have 17 employees. So we've grown quite a lot over the last six years. And our focus has been mostly on the E2 investor visa. However, we do have clients that have applied for the EB5, L1, EB1C. And even a few that have done the EV2 national interest waiver, uh, supplementing the franchise under under that visa category. Interesting. I'm talking about that. It's kind of a nuanced kind of thing. But you mentioned a website. What was the name of that website? Uh, so there's two. Our online platform is vettedbiz.com, um, as well as Visa Franchise, which is our advisory practice. Okay, vetted biz. You said that faster. I didn't catch that. So vettedbiz.com. Now, how do you how do you put an NIW into all this? So we've had, like today in my office, I, I had a client um, from Chile who he has a great background, um, PhD in engineering, and he's unsure if he wants to be an employee in the U.S. or do his own business when, yeah. when he's here. Um, so we're looking at potentials to have him start a, a science and technology related franchise, basically education for kids in, in that space. Interesting. You know, that's a, that's the beauty of uh, some of these programs, the uh, NIW, the E2, they're really flexible, even the O1. Exactly. Uh, you could get it, you could do a lot of cool stuff uh, with it. Uh, so if, if, you know, what is the typical kind of person that contacts you? Obviously the Toolbox Magazine is geared toward immigration professionals. I, I guess if an immigration attorney contacts you, what is the, what, what do they do or how do they connect for that to help their clients out? Yeah, so most of our clients these days are coming through referrals through immigration attorneys. Uh, we've had cases with at least, I don't know, 60, 70 different immigration law firms and mm -hmm. over 100 individual immigration attorneys uh, comprised of those, those different law firms. Um, and it's really divide and conquer where we're most focused on finding, analyzing the businesses and making sure that it's a good business that has the potential to provide for the, the investor's family uh, yeah. and, and fit their needs. While the immigration attorney does everything that's legal related for the, the immigration petition, interview prep, et cetera. And then we strongly advise our clients and 99% of them will engage a franchise specific attorney uh, that also is part of the process. And mm -hmm. then you add in the business plan writer and you have four or so professionals <laughs> and we're all working under a common goal of yeah. finding the best immigration investment process or solution for, for that client. Yeah, you have to develop a team and even that franchise lawyer comes keys. Franchise law is its own world. And, um, you know, the thing about franchise, you got to pick it right, but there's a certain 
certainty that comes with obviously it's an investment you can't guarantee anything but knowing there's a business model that exists and there's a management corporation that supports you and all this kind of stuff it's a easier for a foreign national just comes here out of nowhere to be able to you know get things started um, for sure and i think if you're already living here say you have an h1b and you've spent five years in the u.s and you're going to transition to some other cat visa category startup might be the best option go for the startup if you have the relationships and the connections it's like when we started visa franchise i was already kind of in the space and i had the relationship so it was a lot easier where if you're just parachuting into the us it's extremely competitive market and it's you're going to blow through a lot of cash until you yeah. break even with a startup compared to a franchise or an existing business where it's a little more, it's easier to forecast when you're going to pass that break even point and, and start making a, an income from the business. Now, uh, you're probably going to get asked this uh, all the time. What's the lowest amount of investment you can do for the E2 or at least the projects you have? What are the ranges <clears throat> that they have in common? Sure. So we've had clients apply. So we've had disclaimer, you know, every case is different, but yeah. <laughs> hundreds that didn't get approved the first time. Mm -hmm. And to give an example, one client tried to apply 42,500 invested, another 40K or 50K in the bank account, and that was denied for the substantiality requirement. We always defer to the attorney. So if yeah. the attorney is confident they can get an approval at 70, 80K or less, sure, let's go for it. I think yeah. we prefer that clients invest more, more, exactly. more um, whether that is 100K, 150K but we'll defer to the immigration attorney if, if they're confident that based on this business model and that the investment range of the franchise is anywhere from 50 to 100k and the client only needs to commit 70k and they're they're confident let's let's go for it yeah it it, it kind of that part of it comes out to the consular officer or the uss officer you're dealing with because i've had colleagues get like thirty thousand approved i've even heard of people doing 15 20 000. But there is that wild card variable of who you're dealing with at the end yeah. of the year, who's going to approve it. But if you have a, it really just comes down to the viability of the business. Is this realistic? And is this person exactly. going to run the business? We've never, so we've never had a client that got a final denial if they've tried twice. We have had eight or so clients that could deny the first attempt and all those that reapplied were accepted. Yeah. No one that's invested more than 200K has been denied on the first attempt. Yeah. So you know, it's kind of buyer beware and the more capital, I think gives more credibility yeah. uh, when you're going into that, that consulate officer. But if the immigration attorney and the, the investor wants to try at 70 or 80 K we're fine, but yeah. we'll be super transparent and we'll say what our experience has been applying uh, for a franchise investment at that range or any investment at that range. You know, something that popped in my mind, I remember some franchises require you to go to like, like McDonald's has its own university, you have to go study or there first and learn things. Uh, how intensive is the education requirement for people purchasing these kind of franchises? Do they need to go to some school or study online course first before they can purchase it? Generally, it's like one to four week in, in person with, with COVID that's changed. So a lot has shifted to Zoom uh, where they give that option of Zoom, but we always encourage encouraged to the extent possible that they're actually in person and spending time with the, the management team. And then they'll also send oftentimes uh, trainers to be on site for when the clients opening up their, their franchise. Wonderful. So it's, Support, it's yeah. training on uh, at the franchisor's headquarters, as well as on site training for the first, the pre-opening and the opening of, of the franchise. Wonderful. That's really neat because, yeah, you come from overseas, you don't know what's going on. Having someone hold your hand is really key. And that's one of the, the pluses of the franchise because at the end of the day, they want you to succeed because that's their brand and that's continued income for them. So you have like people rooting for you. You have a cheerleading team behind yeah. you. Yeah. And the beauty with a franchise, it's regulated by the Federal Trade Commission, the FTC. And every franchise needs to have a franchise disclosure document, also called an FDD, where it discloses how many franchises are opening, how many franchises are closing and other key vital information like litigation or any prior bankruptcies against the franchise or their, their owners or the managers. So we, we data mine all that information and make it easier for people to review that. Um, and it's with that, you have a lot more information and you can judge the, the success or failure of a franchise system. How does someone access that information on vetted.biz or something? Do they first need to have a- So vettedbiz.com has 
portfolios or profiles rather on 1,800 plus franchises. And by the end of the year, that should be over 2,000. Mm -hmm. um, and we're just changing it. So it's going to be a premium service at $39 a month where oh, wow. you have total access to the data and you have the contact information on every franchise or even some franchisees to reach out to. And then, yeah, comparable data across franchises in the same industry. So, so you there's guys a free are, version as well as uh, $39 a month currently. So you guys are like experts in this and that you help people look for franchises. Is just the E2 is just a particular avenue for that? Yeah, or like the EB, the EB national interest waiver applicant who, great, he's going to get the green card, but what does he do when he's here? Yeah. And he's always been an entrepreneur. He doesn't want to be an employee. Um, he hasn't had, had work experience in the U S mm. franchising could be a good fit. Very interesting. And uh, how does the general, the fee structure with you guys, is it, uh, you know, percentages or is it like, it's just a fixed fee? How does we that work? charge like a, a, a flat? So basically, um, with, with clients I'll have, or prospective clients, I have an initial consultation, $189 for 45 minutes. Um, if they're not satisfied, I'll give the money back. Oh, wow. I've never had someone ask for the money back, but I've had four cases where I, I stopped the meeting short after five, 10, 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. And I said, we're not the right fit for you. Let yeah. me connect you with a business plan writer. Let me connect yeah. you with a business broker as you, it's probably better to explore those, those alternatives. Um, so it starts with initial consultation and then based on um, the complexity of the case and you know, if they're applying for an EB-5 direct versus uh, E-2, if they want us to also vet the day-to-day -day manager that they're going to be employing in the business, there will be additional costs. So it's quite a, quite a range. Very interesting. So, uh, you know, there's a lot to talk about because each, each, it's just such a fun thing, this franchise, and they're all so different. They're all managed differently. Uh, what are the bases uh, that you look at to see if this company is, is viable or at least is reasonable or something like that? So, yeah, a few different items. Initial investment amount. Also, how long it takes to break even. So you get that information from the franchise or as well as talking to say five franchisees, uh, the sales and the other financial information like the owner's benefits. It's basically how much is the owner making? Mm -hmm. And the owner might have a health insurance and their spouse might be an employee, but basically how much does this business benefit the owner? Is that 50,000 a year, 100,000 a year, $200,000 a year? So really getting that information. And I had already mentioned any litigations, prior bankruptcies, how many locations are opening, how many locations are closing. And then we go through a, di a few different ratios where we've looked at over 100,000 small business administration loans that have gone to franchisees. And from that information, we've been able to deduce the loan default rate on an individual franchise basis, as well as industry by industry. So if you look at franchises in the real estate property management, home care, they're four times as successful as a food and beverage franchise if you just look at the default rate. So for real estate, it's like one in 20 are defaulting on their loan. And many food and beverage concepts, it's one in five are, are defaulting on their, their SBA loan. Interesting, because when you say franchise, people automatically think McDonald's, Burger King, but there's a real estate and management stuff. There's home care stuff. And that, you know, home care, especially, there's no hard costs. Uh, so it's mostly service. I mean, it's going to be hard. Yeah, costs like that, I'm a big fan of service businesses as they're very adaptable and yeah. you're not relying on clients coming to your physical location. And it's not a convenience, like a, a nail salon. How long are you going to, how far are you going to drive to a nail salon or a restaurant? Mm -hmm. Five minutes, 10 minutes? Yeah. Where service, you can serve the, the client 30 minutes away and you're more going to the client. Um, and you could be running an office space for $300 yeah. uh, a month, as opposed to $5,000 a month for a concept where you're bringing the, the customer to you. So we're a very big fan of, of service-based businesses based on how they can adapt. And the low, it's, a, it's, a, it's not a capital intensive business that they're also going to have to negotiate with the landlord every five years yeah. and improve the space. It's very asset light business that also when they want to sell the business sells at a much higher multiple where many service-based businesses will sell at one to two times revenue. Mm -hmm. So you have a home care business that you invested 80, a hundred thousand dollars in the average franchisee might be making 500 K in sales 
and netting 150 K that they take home, that business can sell for 500 K. Yeah. If the investor wants to maybe wants to move on to something else, doesn't need the business anymore for the E2 visa. So it's a pretty high return on investment where for a food and beverage franchise, if you get your money back and your money back in some, you're, you're in a good situation. Yeah. And with regards to those uh, kind of retail kind of uh, investments, like do they, people have to do the construction as well. So if you are going to uh, get like a, I keep going back to food or beverage, but um, do they have to construct or are these pre prep construction or both? Like I don't it's all know. negotiable. How desperate is a landlord? Yeah. If the landlord really wants a tenant, they'll, they'll pay a lot for tenant improvements and uh, give months of free rent. Uh, yeah. If it's a really hot market, you know, best of luck yeah. and you're going to have to pay for everything. It's just, I think what's going to happen is a lot of lawyers are going to contact you for themselves. Like, boy, this is great investment. <laughs> Get the clients. I have some extra cash. I need to put it somewhere. Um, yeah, so we've good. had, we've had um, clients that don't need the visa and how I see it. If you're willing to work hard in the business and you can actually do it full time, there's a lot of opportunities. If you just want to invest cash, you have to have a certain net worth to justify that. Like if you're worth a million dollars and you're putting 300K in a business, that's a big part of your, your net worth. And yeah, maybe it yields 10 to 20%, but there is a risk that it fails where the alternative for a lawyer or other professional is just to invest in an ETF where it's across 500 businesses and it yields 9% and it's much more diversified. So um, there's a lot of different options and I think just no size fits all with this. Well, thank you for sharing all that information. If someone wanted to reach out to you, what is the best way to contact? Is it phone, email, or through the website or all the above? Sure. Yeah, no, the best would be info at visafranchise.com. And I also encourage to, to visit our website at www.visafranchise.com. Well, thank you so much, Patrick. Stay online, but I appreciate you coming on and talking about this important subject. Uh, it's just so needed, especially the craziness of the world. Everyone wants to do an E2. And then the, the, the flexibility of the cost structure of the E2 makes it so reasonable to do. The problem is just not every country has the passport to do it. But exactly. if you pull it off, it's... Yeah, uh, last count, I guess there's like 80 or so countries yeah. that are eligible for the E2. I mean, if I was a foreign person trying to come to the United States or escaping whatever issue I'm dealing with in my home country, E2 is the first thing. I'm like, I got to make enough money to get this E2 and make it flexible and just come as soon as possible. So yeah, like, we have options. The free option, vetted biz, you have the option at $39 a month at vetted biz with more information. And with that, they can reach out to all the franchisors, franchisees. And then if they want us to be more involved and have a much closer working relationship, then uh, there's a significantly higher cost for that. Yeah, but you know, you're getting value for it. So I, I really appreciate you coming on the show, Patrick. Thanks so much. Thanks, John.